there. Hope you are having a good day. I am Christy and we're going to continue on with the How to Social Science 101. Before we move on to the quantitative qualitative divide, I want to do a quick recap and then add some new content that I didn't have time to add in the lectures when I was doing in the course because I only had one lecture for philosophy of, of science and social science and it spilled a little bit into the second one, but because we have a bit more time. I want us to consider in full the evolution of knowledge, how we have come to know what we think knowing is and how we go about producing knowledge. And so far we've seen how human beings have moved from magical stories to reliance on nature and sort of human reasoning. That was said, you know, back in the Greeks. And then we came to the idea that in the middle, in, at least in Europe in the Middle Ages, there was innate knowledge that God had put in the soul. That idea was challenged by later thinkers coming up to the time of the Enlightenment who thought that human beings were a tabla rasa and instead all the information we acquire is from sensory perceptions. And then there was the development of the scientific method and it's the understanding of how it can uh, produce facts and knowledge. We then looked at the role of the logical positivists in sort of, in particular, um, I, I always want to highlight Popper in this, in terms of developing r ways of making sure we're not just engaging in confirmation bias, in the principle of falsification. But along with this, we've also seen some other critiques when the sciences were applied to the social world. It brought along with it not only the methods of scientific inquiry, but also the, the worldview. And before we move on to the qualitative quantitative divide, I want to just spend a little time looking at the critiques that have come about from feminist scholars my computer's making noise, from feminist scholars about the way that the scientific method has um, has been practiced and also the way that it might not be entirely, well, it might not be the only way to get valid knowledge about the social world. And this critique comes in for qualitative research. So let's look a little bit at feminist epistemologies and methodologies. Feminist scholars have made significant contributions to both mainstream and alternative thinking around issues of power, knowing, representation, reflexivity, and legitimation in methodological and epistemological discussions. Lorraine Code, a Canadian feminist philosopher, posed what she called an outrageous question, which is, is the sex of the knower epistemologically significant? Code was grappling with issues of masculinity, power and authority in knowledge creation. If you recall again, when we got to the Enlightenment and the rise of reliance on reason and observation and a detached view and trying to go for, for objective knowledge, those were all good things because especially in the natural sciences, aspiring to that kind of information is helpful. But it's not always appropriate, you know, it's not always appropriate to be completely uh, trying to think that you're entirely objective about something. And this is where we kind of talked about Kant and the idea of the noumenal versus the phenomenal world. We get our, our, we are limited in the kinds of information we can get. And so we have to think about different and more creative ways of getting at information. And this is what, um, part of what feminist critique was coming up about or it was, was discussing. The other issue here too is that this was an entirely masculine world. Women weren't allowed an education. Women didn't have the time or the money to buy the instruments to engage in research into, you know, the, using the telescope or using the newfangled microscope at the time. I mean, eventually some women who um, were wealthy and able to you know, work their way into those fields were successful, but it was very much a male-dominated worldview and one that focused a lot on reason, which made it a bit of a, a dichotomy between reason on the one hand and sort of everything else on the other. And this forced perspective of rationality as being the only way of approaching things, um, not to say that you should approach things irrationally, but what this worldview fails to take into account is that human beings are emotional beings and we don't always behave for rational reasons. So if you only use reason to understand something like human behavior, you're going to have a very hard time using reason to explain it when emotions drive things. 
this is the, that is so. So as, as an example um, of of the way that feminists were starting to engage with the knowledge creation process once women were allowed an education and allowed to have our own money and allowed to l create lives. Um, there's been a big explosion of women participating and a lot of talent coming to the fore. But that integration of women into previously male-only spheres has meant that women have brought a different perspective and also a different perspective on how to do science. Not that it's like, um, and then by a different perspective, I mean critique, not throwing out the baby of the bathwater, but looking at it, questioning the assumptions, basically, that have been uh, brought down over time and that were, that were formulating and framing everything that was being done. There was an emphasis on exposing masculine bias in the natural, physical, and behavioral sciences by feminists. The valuing of traditional masculine characteristics, such as reason, rationality, autonomy, and disconnection, above other things, was also being questioned. Feminist science critiqued gender bias in the collection, interpretation, and organization of data on sex differences in behavioral, biological, and biobehavioral scientific research. An example of this is the exclusive use of male subjects in experimental and clinical research, but then generalizing those results to everyone, as if somehow if you measure what happens to men, you can then infer what happens to women. And feminists pointed out the invisibility of women in the research protocols. This was a big blind spot, and there's a lot of you know reasons that people give for why not why they don't use female subjects. But you still, even if there are problems with female subjects because you have to control for hormone cycles, you still can't generalize from the male body to the female body if you don't use female subjects. And this was something that feminists had to bring up because, again, in the worldview that existed at the time, it didn't seem weird that they were doing that. Knowledge, both academic and popular was based on men's lives, male ways of thinking, and directed toward the problems articulated by men. Dorothy Smith had argued in 1974 that sociology had been based on and built up within the male social universe, while the lives of women were largely left to novelists or poets. This made women's lives and female-dominated areas of life, such as domestic work, child care, and caring for parents, entirely invisible to knowledge producers. When women's lives were studied and theorized, it occurred within that male stream lens. And it was the British sociologist Hilary Graham who asked, do her answers fit his questions? Women's experiences were being measured within surveys designed on the basis of men's lives. Again, this is this assumption that if you, that if you have a male subject, that you can generalize from him to everybody else. And this was a, a bias that needed to be pointed out and rectified to improve our scientific knowledge. Feminist sociologists have been particularly prominent in their participation in advancing knowledge. Feminist empiricists have considered how feminist values can inform empirical inquiry, how the scientific method can be improved in light of feminist demonstrations of the sex bias in traditional positivistic practices of science. Feminist sociologists began to criticize positivism as a philosophical framework and, more specifically, quantitative methods for detached and objective scientific research and the objectification of research subjects. We'll get on to how they look at the research subjects in terms of power and also this idea of being detached and objective when we look at reflexivity. Oakley suggested that, contrary to an objective, standardized, and detached approach to interviewing other people, the goal of finding out about people through an interview was best achieved when the relationship of the interviewer and the interviewee is non-hierarchical, and when the interviewer is prepared to invest his or her own personal identity in the relationship. If you think about doing an interview, the person asking, asking the questions doesn't actually give up anything about him or herself. It's the person talking who's doing all the sort of giving up all the information. And so this creates a, a power relationship between the two people where one gives and one takes. Feminists looked at this and questioned whether or not that, you know, basically said that that was not ideal way to get information from people is just to extract it from them like you're mining, you know, ore from, from the ground. They're people. And so you have to interact with them as people. Feminist researchers have actively engaged with methodological innovation through challenging conventional or mainstream ways of collecting, analyzing, and presenting data. 
Initially, this involved challenging positivist frameworks and the dominance of quantitative methods and experimenting with novel ways of documenting and representing women's experiences or everyday worlds. More recently, quantitative methods have been accepted and adopted by feminist scholars, including myself. I consider myself a like a feminist critic in terms of the critique that I bring to my analysis, but obviously I'm, I'm very much into the quant side if the question demands it. Now, feminist sociologists recognize that researchers and respondents have a different and unequal relationship to knowledge, and that within most research projects, the final shift of power between the researcher and the respondent is balanced in favor of the researcher, for it is she who eventually walks away. The current focus in feminist scholarship has moved on from the question of whether there are power inequalities between researchers and respondents to consider how that power influences knowledge production and construction processes. They're evaluating the role in which the researcher, him or herself, plays in the collection of data and the presentation of data. This is making a different claim about what is happening in the scientific process. So if you think about it from the natural science side, people are observers and they're objective on the outside. But when you ask someone a question and they answer you, you are co-creating that data. You are asking, you're, as a researcher, contributing to the creation of it by the way, you, the words you use and the way you frame it. And when you hear what the other person says and you interpret it, that's also part of the co-creation of that data. And acknowledging that role and taking responsibility for it and accounting for it in your research design is something that feminist scholars have been critiquing the you know, sociology and the social sciences about in order to improve their data quality. Another issue is reflexivity. The issue of reflexivity and the way in which our, our own subjectivity becomes entangled in the lives of others has concerned many social scientists. But feminist sociologists in particular have vo been vocal on this point, and reflexivity has come to be regarded as one of the pivotal themes in discussion of feminist research. Most feminist researchers openly reflect on, acknowledge, and document their social location and the roles they play in co-creating data and in constructing knowledges. By way of example, many times when you read a, a journal article, the authors of it will basically remove themselves as a contributor, you know, their voice. They don't often speak in I, they don't talk about themselves in the first person. Instead, what is presented is almost a disembodied voice, objective voice that's expounding on facts. And feminist scholars, is, when you're doing social research, reject that idea because they understand that as a researcher, your the phrase, where you stand often depends on where you sit. Where you come from in life has a role in terms of framing what is of interest to you, of how you initially interpret things. All of this stuff is you bring it with you to your own research. And from a feminist perspective, the honest thing to do is to admit it, is to put the information up there so that people can understand where you're coming from when they're reading your work. And that's in opposition to removing yourself as a subjective person in this process and just writing in a way that makes it sound like what you're presenting are objective facts and truths. So reflexivity in social research, again, comes directly out of the feminist critique of the, the norms and values imported into the social sciences from the natural sciences, the lack of reflective criti critique of whether or not social sciences um, were best served by the same attitudes and values toward the subjects being researched as in the natural sciences. In the previous videos, we've been reviewing the basic philosophical differences between qualitative and quantitative research and a history of how both of these approaches came to be established within the social sciences. Qualitative and quantitative research allows us to explain the exact same questions but from very different perspectives. For instance, if you wanted to get at why do people vote, in a qualitative approach, you would go and ask people and identify the things that came up, ask them to tell stories, look for common themes, maybe by partisanship, maybe by part of the country, maybe by age cohort, and you would look for you know, information that you could generalize into a pattern that you could then test deductively. Whereas with quantitative research, you are always starting with a general theory and using it to predict either an attitude or a behavior or something about people that you want to know. We're going to go through a quick example of what is 
um, known in political science as cognitive mobilization theory. In recent times, the theory goes, people have had easier access to higher education in the forms of mass communication, which improves their ability to digest political information. This results in the increased political sophistication of the electorate, but that political sophistication produces a concomitant of the concomitant effect of increasing their dissatisfaction with the incumbent government and the chances for a protest vote. So if you want to see whether or not the consumption of information and education can predict whether or not someone votes, you would, as a quantitative you know, researcher, do this. Now, Clark et al. in their book in 2004 operationalized the cognitive mobilization model as follows in the following operational equation that voting turnout, which is a one or a zero, so this is a, a likelihood model, is some function of a constant, which is the base rate at which everyone, the same probability everyone has in that sample of voting, plus the effect of education plus the effect of your exposure to the media media coverage of the election, plus the effect of your interest in the election, plus the, infer, plus the effect of the information relative to voting, plus the extent of dissatisfaction with the government's policies, and then controlling for other demographic things such as age, sex, being a member of an ethnic minority, and so on. You would run statistical text, tests, and then you would evaluate the results to determine if the predictions that the theory makes are sustained by the data. It will the, the theory will either be confirmed by the data, partially confirmed, or we can reject the theory the hypotheses derived from the theory because the null hypothesis has not been overcome. And that is how you do the quant side of of political science in this case. Whereas quantitative research is grounded in data, qualitative research is grounded in words. Its ontology is constructivist. Phenomena are not out there, but the result of social interactions between individuals. Epistemologically, it's interpretivist. An effort is made to understand the social world by examining how people interpret it. And of course, it's more likely to be inductive or at least you know, very descriptive. From Burr, the qualitative perspective she writes up can be represented as follows. If knowledge of the world does not come from the nature of the world as it really is, then where does it come from? That answer, according to constructivists, is social construction. People construct it between themselves. Social interactions of all kinds, and especially language, are of interest. And at any one time, what is widely accepted is not a product of objective observation, but of social processes and interactions between people. Constructions of the world sustain patterns of social actions that include some and exclude others. And our construction of the world is bound up with power relations, what is and is not permissible in a society. Michael, I'm sorry, Michel Foucault, for instance, talked about the way people talk and think about things in society have implications for how we treat others. Our representations entail certain kinds of power relations. So for the qualitative perspective, areas of interest are how do people construct their account of events to build defensible identities and or have their versions of, ex of events accepted by others? I think YouTube is a great place to watch this in action. You can watch an anti-feminist video, you can watch a feminist video and watch how each creator, content creator constructs an account of events to build a defensible identity for themselves and to have their version of events accepted by others. We can also examine if we want to do research into the social world, speech acts and how speech act theory would, uh, draws attention to language as a function, not describing things, not using language to describe things, but to perform actions. The term you're grounded, or the phrase I should say, you're grounded, if spoken by a parent, has a specific meaning. When a judge says, I sentence you to six months, those linguistic actions have a function that are performed and then have impact on the social world, you know, or that person's lives. So an interpretive repertoire examines linguistic resources that people draw upon when constructing their accounts. And another example too is whenever you see a politician on TV, you might right, automatically start listening for spin, right? Because you understand that that person is constructing a specific version of events based on their party identity. And that's precisely what qualitative researchers do when they look at how people create their social worlds, use language to build up a specific version of it, and what kind of ideas and values are they communicating. 
well, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna not do the types of qualitative research because I think this was might have been in the quant side, and I just wanted people to get to know it. But we're gonna be going through ethnography, interviews, and focus groups in depth in future lectures. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, skip all this now, and I just wanna finally, I think here we've got the last couple of slides before we look at what's in common and what's different. So in the quantitative research structure, it's just like in the natural sciences. You you know you have a question, you do some background reading and you look at the literature, you look at the theories, and if you're coming up with you know a new um, account to try to fill a gap in our knowledge, you want to use two theories perhaps to kind of combine their impact to look at a gap in our knowledge, you would then um, build this, this causal mechanism, your theory, you would divine, uh, sorry, devise uh, a hypotheses in order to test it in a way that you could be shown to be wrong, you do an experiment, you analyze your results, you know, is it confirmed, is it partially confirmed, is it rejected, and then you have a think. And then you go back into the world and maybe think about your theory, or you might test your data in a, with new data, test for, with a data set from a different time period, a different country. And you do this again and again and again. In qualitative research, there's a bit more iterative work going on because um, it's not so much about deduction as it is about induction. So you'll have a question, you'll still do the research background, you'll still do the same process that you would do for the quant side in terms of making sure you know the lit, you know the existing findings, you know the theory. Then you would select your data source, the people that you're interested in, you collect the data, interpret it, do some conceptual work, maybe rephrase things or refine your theory a bit more, then collect more data and refine your research question and write up the results. So they are very similar, except that step of um, falsification can't be included in qualitative research because that's not the goal of it. It's descriptive, it's inductive. Therefore, the way that you improve your theory is through observation and more data collection looking at you know it from that perspective rather than looking at a statistical measure uh, a cutoff point of the 0 0.05 or something what do quants and qual have in common both are empiricist both quantitative and qualitative methods rely upon observations quants use survey questions as a means to measure beliefs attitudes opinions and behaviors while qualitative you know looks at the experience of the setting that a person is in there's analysis of conversation to understand meaning and context but both in the end, rely on looking at the world and collecting data. Both are problem focused. Quants are driven by well formed research questions designed to test potential causal mechanisms. Qualitative methods also can be used to investigate well formed research questions into social phenomenon. For instance, do men and women use different frameworks when evaluating party leaders. There was this assumption that women could be wooed by Tony Blair or that they can be won over, you know, getting their hearts, um, winning over their hearts and minds. Whereas men have, you know, these very rational policy notions and they just sort of look at competence. But when we separated, you know, men and women into groups and have them talk about party leaders, we didn't find any systematic sex differences between the groups that looked anything like that. So it's not a, it's not falsification. However, it is a data point that says, you know, I don't see anything here. Maybe we should re-examine this, this, this uh, assumption, or at least do more data collection before we keep perpetuating this idea. Both can use and benefit from the um, you know, theories and hypothesis. Obviously, in quants, you've got the null hypothesis. If my theory is wrong, I would expect to find no relationship between x and y. And statistical methods reveal whether or not we can reject the null hypothesis and then that suggests, or that requires us to accept the alternative hypothesis, that there is an effect. As I said, you can't test, and I, should, I, I kind of use the word testing here, which I probably shouldn't have, but the qualitative research can also engage in theoretical development, and it can look at, you know, again, that prediction that I should see some kind of difference in the way men and women talk about the party leaders if this sex difference actually exists in, in the world. I should be able to find evidence of it. In terms of the use of quantitative and qual, some people just go quants, some people just go qual, but they don't have to be separated, and people do use them together. So some people approach it from a quants point of view with qual as su uh, supporting or improving quants. An example of this would be cognitive interviews. Asking people, when I ask you the question, um, how much attention do you pay to politics? What kinds of things come to mind when I say the word politics? Social scientists, like a lot of scientists, are kind of have one way of looking at the world. And what we think is political might not be what the average person in the street 
thinks is political. So qualitative research can really benefit the quant side by doing what a, this process called cognitive interviewing. There are also some people who think that qual is superior to quants. That's a much less common view, but it's out there. You can link quants and qual sequencing from qual to quants or from quants to qual. You might use your qual approach first to look for um, to, to look for patterns to test, you know, a hypothesis to generate, and then you would go to the quant side to actually test it. Alternatively, you can triangulate the use of quants and qual. Use them at the same time or at different time periods, not with the intent of sequencing them, but to triangulate your results. So you might use an experimental method, a survey method, and a qualitative approach to come at the same question from three different angles. And if you find something similar across the modes of data collection and analysis, that strengthens the argument that you're getting something that exists in reality. Both quants and qual just you know, focus on different aspects of the same issue, and that allows them to provide unique and possibly divergent results to the same questions. Now the last bit of this lecture has to do with the use of BES data and the QESB, which is my study, the Qualitative Election Study of Britain. And what I do in this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we're getting on a half an hour already, but we looked at the way that the British Election Study evaluate, had people evaluate the leaders on a 10 point scale, might have been an 11 point scale. So as you can see here, uh, you get questions like, on a scale that runs, yeah, the 11 point scale, 0 to 10, where 0 means strongly dislike and 10 means strongly like, how do you feel about uh, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, and Nick Clegg? And as you can see here, you might get uh, like two points of difference, or just under two points of difference, or you might get almost no difference. And the question is, well, what is a one point difference in competence? What is a half a point difference in knowing what you're talking about? And what we did instead was we evaluated how people described the leaders. Um, we had them do some silent brainstorming before they started the conversation. Then we had them um, denote on the piece of paper if their the association was positive, negative, or neutral. And then we had them discuss the party leaders and their impressions. And what we did was we found that when people used language to describe the leaders, that Gordon Brown was seen as having experience and effort and that he was a nice guy and, you know, back in the day he was pretty good, but he's just really not a very good leader and he lacks people skills and he's kind of a bit of, you know, smarmy bit of PR. If you've lived through the British election of 2010, that sounds intuitively plausible. But there's no way that you could get this combination of characteristics clustered about around Gordon Brown only using means or scores on an 11 point scale. In comparison, David Cameron, who ended up winning the election, had far more positive associations with leadership qualities as leader of the conservatives. He was fresh, he was new, he was dynamic, um, he was also seen as a family man, but he was also seen as very arrogant, maybe not very well prepared, and quite untrustworthy. That didn't change much between 2010 and 2015. And while Nick Clegg in 2010 had f fewer things said about him because he was more of an unknown quantity, and also the fact that he, people tended to say he was experienced, the one thing that you do see that's unique about Nick Clegg in 2010 is that people associated him with honest and sincere, being sincere. And if you notice in these other slides, that yeah, n neither Cameron nor Brown have, has any positive comments about their honesty. And this honesty characteristic that really distinguishes Nick Clegg, again, can't be found just by looking at means from an 11 point scale. So where we concluded, and we eventually got this published, that Gordon Brown was seen as empathetic and that people viewed his mistakes through a human lens, which you, again, wouldn't necessarily get from the newspaper coverage or from the means. David Cameron was regarded as having leadership qualities, but this was offset about with perceptions of his being untrustworthy, arrogant, and slick, but he does come out ahead on the concept of being a good leader. Nick Clegg's perceptions, they don't really change despite the fact that he did, was involved in three debates, and then we suggest it was his perceived lack of leadership skills and experience that hindered the Liberal Democrats as a viable alternative to the two-party dominance. So even though people like Nick Clegg, end of the day, didn't think that the Lib Dems were really going to do it. What Nick Clegg did was motivate people who were borderline that Lib Dem voters to get excited and get out to vote. That was our conclusion based on our data. All right, I think that's enough. <laughs>
this is a lot of talking, so I'm going to go ahead and get going on editing the video so I can get it out. Just a quick scheduling note that I am leaving to attend a, a research workshop next week, so my schedule will be a bit on the dodgy side, but I'll see what I can do in terms of getting some content to you guys. All right, my fellow geeks and nerds, thank you for your time and for your attention, and I think all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy, and you've been awesome. I will see you later.